Hey everyone, great to be back with you all again. If you were like me in the 90s, assuming you were even alive in the 90s, that is, you couldn't really go to any arcade without seeing a Virtua Racing machine nearby. The game was just that iconic, and still is. Even to this day, 3D racing games, as well as any title with 3D polygonal graphics, really owe a lot to this one. But the game's release didn't stop with arcades, oh no. This game would find itself being ported to the Sega Genesis, the 32X, the Sega Saturn, which I don't actually own a copy of here, mobile phones, which I also don't actually own a copy of here, PS2 as part of the Sega Ages 2500 label, and even a new Sega Ages release on the Switch. Needless to say, the home release versions of these games were in no short supply, but with the exception of the newer Switch version, the rest of these releases have been around a pretty long time. Does playing it now have the same impact that it did back in 1994? Strap in, and we'll see just how well Virtua Racing for the Sega Genesis and other platforms holds up. Today! Developed by Sega AM2 and released in March of 1994 for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive, Virtua Racing is a port of the successful arcade racer by the same development team of two years prior. The task of bringing this game to home consoles was no easy transition, as the Sega Genesis was not capable of pulling off the look or feel of the arcade version on its own. Enter the Sega Virtual Processor, or SVP chip. This chip would allow any game used with it to render polygons in real time. If you saw my video for the original Star Fox on the SNES, you'll remember I talked about the Super FX chip and how it allowed for the same possibilities on Nintendo's platform, just a year prior. The SVP chip took the same approach, but yielded slightly different results. Calling the SVP chip better than the Super FX chip would be a bit unfair, as the SVP chip was made about a year later with different hardware capabilities. But there is no doubt that its performance was a significant improvement over the Super FX, with much faster speeds and a better resolution to cause less slowdown. From what I can tell, the SVP chip would handle all of the 3D polygon graphics, while the Genesis itself would handle the 2D backgrounds and the rest, also contributing to the more stable frame rate. That said, I still enjoyed the presentation and color palette of the Super FX chip significantly, as I feel Nintendo has always put a special level of charm into their own products that no one else has ever been able to replicate. But this chip affected the game in other, interesting ways, too. Just for comparison's sake, I've pulled out a regular Genesis cartridge here to show you all the difference. Now, as you can see, Virtua Racing is significantly larger than the standard cartridge, all because of the addition of that SVP chip. It almost looks like Sonic and Knuckles combined with another game, yes? Well, there's a reason for that, too. One of the ideas initially pitched at Sega was to make the SVP chip see its own separate release, possibly in the form of another lock-on cartridge like Sonic and Knuckles, depending on how well Virtua Racing sold. This would then allow you to buy the game separately and be able to save on both development costs and the cost of the game. Speaking of... The game originally retailed for 100 US dollars. Yes, seriously. It was the most expensive Genesis game ever made. The development of the SVP chips and the money it took to put them into each and every cartridge was immense, and simply not a sustainable business model. The plans for the chip, however, would be cancelled, as Sega would focus their efforts on the 32X, and eventually the Sega Saturn instead. Now that you know more about that long and winded history, let's talk about the game itself. Just as in the style of the arcade release, the game features three different courses represented by three levels of difficulty, with the beginner course Big Forest, the intermediate course Bay Bridge, and the expert course Acropolis. You're only given one car to drive, though you can choose whether to give it manual or automatic transmission. There are also some additional difficulty settings in the options menu. After selecting the course and watching your pit crew set you up, it's time to race. The controls are pretty simple, and about standard for the time. The D-pad moves your car left and right, and lets you shift with up and down. A is your accelerator, B is your brake, and C lets you change your driver's camera view during play. The strategy comes from learning how to keep a consistent speed, but also figure out when to slow down or brake, and properly get around the sharper turns. You go through 5 laps against 16 other AI opponents to reach the finish line. One thing that may surprise first-time players is just how difficult it will be to get to the finish line the first time playing. You aren't given a large amount of time to screw up and still make it to the end, ensuring you'll likely have to replay the courses multiple times before feeling like you've got the hang of things. In fact, on any of the difficulties besides the easiest, you're likely to not even reach first place if you mess up once. It's that unforgiving. 
The biggest factor that will hold you back from winning at first will be getting used to coming around the sharpest and most narrow of turns. Some will work better when you brake for a second, turn, and accelerate at the end, while others will work best if you keep accelerating the whole time. There's also a few that require letting go of the gas, turning, and accelerating in short bursts until you've come around the turn completely through a drift. This is especially nasty in the third and final course, which has the longest and most difficult turn of the entire game. Mastering this while keeping your distance from other cars is no small feat, especially since there's a bit of an inconsistency where some turns will appear very large and open, but require sharper braking than you would initially believe based on other turns in the same stage. Finishing any of these stages in first place with the difficulty set to normal or higher will also award you with the game's true ending sequence. You can also unlock a mirror mode if you manage to get first place in all three of these on the normal and hard settings. After playing through each stage, you're also given the chance to watch a replay of your last race before returning to the main menu. It may not seem like it, but this kind of cinematic replay view was not exactly commonplace yet. Though games like Atari's Hard Driven, one of the few 3D polygon racers to predate this one, had their own method of doing this. The difference, however, was the speed of it all, as Virtual Racer simply blew every other project before it out of the water, with a far higher speed and frame rate to feast your eyes on. There's no doubt that people playing this version of the game for the first time will have some issues with it. For one thing, this kind of graphical model is considered to be just about ancient by modern standards, despite its impact at the time. It's also hard to see more than a couple of feet in front of you, making some sharp turns come up a little quicker than you would like, and causing more spin-outs. In short, it's definitely not the arcade experience, which still holds up far better. With all of that said, however, I do think the Genesis version of the game still has some charms to it. While you can certainly argue that the replay value is very lax due to having a small selection of courses and only one car to race with, a sentiment that I happen to agree with, I still think that the game feels surprisingly smooth despite the now outdated visuals. Despite the hiccups I mentioned above, it does do well enough of a job to keep you invested, and wanting to try again and again until you've mastered that high score you've already attempted over 20 times in a row. With that said, there is no doubt that the Genesis version of the game is also the most outdated. But the good news is that there have been plenty of other newer and mostly better ways to experience it since then, which I'll happily delve into right now. Now this won't be a super intensive technical analysis, as channels such as Digital Foundry already handle areas like that far better than I ever could, but I'll provide enough explanation so that you have a decent understanding of the differences. First up is the 32X port of the game, titled Virtua Racing Deluxe. It was released later the same year, and on a much smaller cartridge this time. Yes, allowing the jump to 32-bit graphics did wonders for the look of this one, as the pixel count and frame rate were vastly improved once again. On top of this, you're given a time attack mode, two more cars to choose from, one with a better drift ability and slower speed, and another with a higher amount of speed but slower drift ability, and two new tracks called Highland and Sand Park. This was dubbed by many fans to be the best version of the game, and still holds up shockingly well even now. I admit, it's one of my two personal favorite versions as well. Next came the Sega Saturn version. It boosted a whopping four new cars and seven new courses. This was on top of a new Grand Prix mode, which would have players drive through a series of about 20 laps to get points and progress further. You'd think it would be the superior version of the game, but unfortunately this was not the case. The Saturn version was developed by Time Warner Interactive instead of Sega AM2, which may have had to do with why the game felt so quote-unquote off and unstable. It's a real shame, since the new features were pretty nice. After this, we had the PS2 version, called Virtual Racing Flatout, which was released in Japan under the Sega Ages 2500 label, and later released as part of a collection in the US called Sega Classics Collection. This version also included the Grand Prix mode, as well as four new cars and three new courses. It was also far better to look at than any home console version before it, and had much smoother controls and visuals as a result. Up until the most recent release, it was my second favorite way to play the game on a home console. Until now. You may have heard this by now, but developers M2 have been knocking it out of the park with their successful re-releases of classic games for years, and the Sega Ages release of Virtua Racing for the Nintendo Switch is yet another gem in that long list of greats. Not only does this version manage to perfectly replicate the original arcade experience, it actually improves on it, with a full 60 frames per second resolution, surpassing the 30 frames per second of the original. It also manages to make the game's graphics look more like an aesthetic choice instead of a hardware limitation, and I really dig it. The Switch version also includes the Grand Prix mode that made the other versions so fun, 
and the possibility for up to eight players to do a split-screen multiplayer race. The only real sacrifice with this version is the lack of extra cars and tracks like the 32X, Saturn, and PS2 versions had. But as far as being faithful to the arcade original, it goes above and beyond and is easily the most accessible version out there. But going back to the Genesis version, does it still hold up in a modern setting? I actually think it does. Don't get me wrong, it won't look anywhere near as impressive as when it first hit the console market to a new gamer, but the speed and fluidity as well as the tight controls actually give it a lot of leeway. If you were able to manage with Star Fox's graphics, then I see no reason you can't also enjoy the look and feel of this game as well. It may seem hard to believe now, but this game actually laid out the foundations of what we would go on to see in current racing titles. Multiple driver views, replay videos with various camera angles, etc, etc. All in all, I'm happy to say that there are a wide number of options to choose from for playing this game, and most of them are well worth looking into. While the Genesis version has been all but rendered obsolete now and the SVP chip abandoned, the game still manages to showcase a lot of heart and personality that I think even new players would find interesting. No, it can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with most other modern racing titles, that's true, but for a game that would go on to inspire most of the elements even seen in those games now, I think that's a fair trade-off. And that's going to do it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. Have you played this game before yourself? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're feeling generous, please consider donating to my Patreon, where awesome people like Brandon, Thomas, Johan, Cielo, Andrew, and Jonathan all help to keep this channel alive. Until next time.